Um, good morning, everyone. Like Felix just said, my name's Rory. Um, I'm on the team here. I lead all the worship and production teams um, here at HTC. And if you have any questions about that or interested in joining one of those teams, do come and chat to me at the end of the service. I'd love to speak to you. Um, a little bit about me, I'm married to Hannah, um, we've been here at HTC for seven years now, and we've just had our first child actually, um, he's called Simeon, I think there's a photo coming up, he was helping me write my sermon earlier this week, um, if you hear him screaming at the back, he's probably just telling me that I said something wrong. Um, but why don't I pray as we um, start looking at God's word at this uh, short verse together today. God, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you that there is so much life in your word, even in 11 short words. I pray today that as I speak, that you would be speaking through me. May I be your vessel. May you be transforming lives here this morning. Give us soft hearts to receive what it is you are trying to say to us today. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So this week, um, the Archbishop of Canterbury has been hosting the Lambeth Conference, which is a once-in-a-decade uh, conference where all the Anglican bishops and archbishops around the world gather together. And uh, there's about 660 of them. You can see in that photo, there's many of them there looking all kind of dashing in their big clerical robes. Um, and at the start of the conference, the Queen wrote a letter to the Archbishop of Canterbury, sending her blessing for him and for everyone gathered there. And this is what she wrote as part of her letter. She wrote this. Throughout my life, the message and teachings of Christ have been my guide, and in them I find hope. It is my heartfelt prayer that you will continue to be sustained by your faith in times of trial and encouraged by hope at times of despair. Now, over the past year, we've heard quite a lot about the Queen's faith um, through the Platinum Jubilee celebrations. But isn't it amazing to read that once again um, of, a, of the Queen, of the monarch, of a, of a massive global leader? I find hope in the message and teachings of Christ. They are my guide. But it's the second sentence of that quote that I want to uh, dwell on today. It's the Queen's prayer that these bishops, that they would continue to be sustained by their faith in times of trial, and encouraged by hope at times of despair. And that's the question we're asking today. How can I have faith when it feels like God isn't in control? How can I have faith in a time of trial when it feels like God is distant or when he's turned his back on us? It's one of the hardest questions for us to grapple with. The thought of it can fill us with doubt and fear and we can even um, end up feeling like we're misunderstanding who God is. But it's also one of the most important questions for us to consider. Because we live in a world where it doesn't always feel like God is in control. Think about the current events around the world. Think about the war in Russia and Ukraine. Think about the tensions between the US and China over Taiwan. Think about climate change and the way that our world is changing and habitats and homes are being destroyed. Think about the uh, global fuel prices going up through the roof, the cost of living going up. Think about even down the road, um, the political instability in Westminster over the last few months. But then also, even closer to home, think about our own personal instability. Maybe, maybe we feel unstable about our finances right now or our health, or our home life, our families, our relationships, maybe our work. So we'll all be able to approach this question um, of how can I have faith when it feels like God isn't in control with some tangible experience of a situation that feels out of control. And what we're going to do today is we're going to unpack that question by looking at Isaac and this verse in Hebrews. Now, Isaac's not a strange inclusion into Faith's National Portrait Gallery. He faithfully carried the promises of God, and he passed them down through the generations. But what is unusual about his inclusion is the thing that he is mentioned for in that verse. Why don't we look at it again? Hebrews 11, verse 20. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau in regard to their future. On the surface, that, that seems absolutely fine, doesn't it? It seems good. It seems right. But really, it was something that was totally out of his control. 
Isaac hadn't intended to bless Jacob and Esau in the way that he actually did. But strangely, this is the moment that he is commended for his faith. So before we look at the actual moment that is being described in the passage, we need to look at Isaac's faith before it. And what we find is that Isaac's, the foundation of Isaac's faith is his experience of God's faithfulness. Think back to the start of Hebrews 11 that we looked at the other week, um, verses 1 and 2. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. Isaac had been sure that God was with him. He was sure that God wanted to bless him and his family. For he had received this promise that had been given to his father Abraham about his descendants being as numerous as the stars in the sky. God had also promised him that and the promise of a heavenly home that we looked at last week. He had seen God's faithfulness in the blessing of children, even though his wife, Rebecca, had been unable to have children. He saw God's faithfulness in a year of drought when no one else's crops grew, but Isaac's crops grew a hundredfold, and he was blessed with wealth and influence in the foreign land that he was living in. And he saw God's faithfulness when he was then forced to flee that land through the provision of a new place to live, and new favor there. God is faithful. God was faithful to Isaac, and he knew that. And there's something so powerful for us as well in remembering our own experiences of God's faithfulness to us. Just earlier this week, um, I was having lunch with some of the other staff, and I had the opportunity to share a bit of my testimony with them. And it was so encouraging to me to remember how God had been so faithful to me by placing really specific people in my life throughout my teenage years um, just to share the gospel with me, to persevere with me as I ask questions, to, to reveal to me who Jesus is and for ultimately for me to put my trust in him. So for all of us, we need to count our blessings, however big or small. We need to remember our own experiences of God's faithfulness to us, however significant or insignificant Lord, thank you for my baptism, as Rex will hopefully be able to say in later years. It might be, Lord, thank you for your faithfulness in providing that car parking spot close to church this morning. Thank you that the bus was on time. Thank you for the new job. Thank you for bringing me to faith in Jesus. Thank you that your mercies are new for me yet again this morning. There's power for us in remembering God's faithfulness to us. It builds our faith and trust in him so that when the storms and trials of life do come, we have this foundation for our faith, that hope and expectation that God has been faithful and therefore he will continue to be faithful to us. Remembering God's faithfulness to us can be that anchor when the storms come. Now Isaac has this foundation for his faith and this is what uh, prepares him for the trial that he then faces and for ultimately why he is uh, named in Hebrews 11. Because what happens next is not what he was expecting, it was not what he was hoping for. So let's have a look at that. If you wanted to, you could turn to Genesis 27, and we're going to be flicking through some of the the verses there right at the start of the Bible. Um, And what we find at the start of Genesis 27, Isaac is reaching the end of his life. His body is beginning to fail him. He is losing his sight. He's literally living by faith and not by sight. And he's getting ready to pass on um, this parental blessing to his firstborn Esau. In the ancient world, this parental blessing was incredibly important for people to secure. It would guarantee them this future inheritance for their family, which in this case, uh, for this family, was a really big one. If you remember what what Abraham had been promised that we looked at last week, Esau was eagerly expecting and waiting to receive this blessing. So Isaac calls Esau over to him, and he gives him some instructions. He says, Now then, get your weapons, your quiver and bow, and go out to the open country to hunt some wild game for me. Prepare me the kind of tasty food I like, and bring it to me to eat, so that I may give you my blessing before I die. So Esau goes off to complete this task, but Rebecca, Isaac's wife, she overhears and she interferes with this situation. Rebecca remembers that God had actually given her a promise um, about her and her children at their birth. God had promised her this. Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older, Esau, will serve the younger, Jacob. 
So knowing this, Rebecca then interferes. She tells Jacob to steal the blessing that Isaac was planning to give to Esau. Jacob is pretty reluctant at first, but when he realizes what he's going to gain from this situation, he is pretty swiftly won over to the plan. And so Re- Rebecca goes and she camouflages uh, Jacob so that he would appear like Isaac, um, he would appear like Esau, sorry. Um, Esau, the name Esau actually literally means uh, the one who is hairy. Um, when Esau, Esau was born, he was very, very hairy, and so he was given this name. And so in order to camouflage um, him, uh, Rebecca covers Jacob in hair goatskin hair um, and then uh, she also then goes and cooks Isaac's favorite food just like Isaac had asked for so Jacob then comes to Isaac and he claims that he is Esau and Isaac in his blindness perceives maybe something isn't quite as expected and he says the voice is the voice of Jacob but the hands are the hands of Esau but Jacob in his deceptive ways he continues to claim that he is Esau and so Isaac In faith, trusting that what he was being told was indeed true, he blesses Jacob instead of Esau. And then this is the blessing given to Jacob. Isaac blesses him and says, May God give you of heaven's dew and of earth's richness, an abundance of grain and new wine. May nations serve you and peoples bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers and may the sons of your mother bow down to you. May those who curse you be cursed and those who bless you be blessed. It's a blessing of abundance, of fruitfulness, of power, of glory, a blessing to know more blessing. And then Esau appears on the scene shortly afterwards, and he comes to his father as he'd been instructed, ready to receive the blessing. And Isaac, thinking that he'd already given Esau this blessing, is confused. Who are you, he says. I'm your son, I'm your firstborn, I'm Esau. And what happens next is Isaac, it says in Genesis, trembles violently. And he says, who was it then that hunted game and brought it to me? I ate it just before you came in and I blessed him. And truly he will be blessed. So this is why Isaac's inclusion in Hebrews is slightly confusing. Yes, Isaac was a man of faith. But this doesn't seem to be a story of Isaac's faith. But maybe more Jacob's deception. But it's what Isaac does next that shows his great faith. By faith, he'd accidentally blessed Jacob with Esau's blessing. But when he realized what had happened, he doesn't retract the blessing. He'd said, I blessed him, and indeed he will be blessed. Now, remember, Isaac has this foundation for his faith. He trusts in God's faithfulness, even when this incredibly important moment for his family is suddenly turned upside down. And so because of his great faith, because of his great compassion for his son, Isaac then chooses to bless Esau as well. Not with an equivalent blessing. It's definitely not that. Not with a contradictory blessing either. It's not that. But the blessing he gives to Esau is a merciful blessing. Esau, who is angry and bitter. Esau, who is desperate for any blessing after being robbed of his own. Esau, he is blessed with mercy for his future. Yes, it won't be abundant and fruitful and glorious and powerful, but ultimately, he will get what he wants. He will get his own freedom. And this is how Isaac blesses Esau. It's worth just seeing the the similarities between the two as it comes up on the screen. So Isaac blesses Esau. Your dwelling will be away from the earth's richness, away from the dew of heaven above. You will live by the sword and you will serve your brother. But when you grow restless, you will throw his yoke from off your neck. Sometimes our expectations don't match up with God's intentions. We can build plans for our lives, but they aren't necessarily what God has planned for our lives. In Proverbs 19, it says, Many are the plans in a man's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. Isaac has faith that God will still use these blessings for good, even though they weren't what he originally intended. Perhaps in God's eyes, it wasn't a mistake at all that Jacob um, would deceive him. And we can know that now. We know that now, looking back on it. God had planned this all along, that Jacob was the one who was going to continue God's promise and God's line. 
of people. It was exactly as God had intended, even if it was not as Isaac had expected. Sometimes our circumstances don't feel like they could at all be what God had planned for us or intended for us. And so we can get confused and frustrated and assume that God just isn't in control. Um, Some of you will know that uh, this time last year, my wife Hannah and I went through a really rough uh, couple of months. Um, Hannah's uh, dad died, a friend died, um, we had some family illness, and we had a miscarriage. Our world was turned upside down in a matter of weeks. We didn't know what had hit us. It certainly did not feel like God's abundant life for us. It didn't feel like he was in control of those situations. And the challenge for all of us as we go through unexpected and difficult times in our lives, is how do we continue to have faith through them? How can we continue to have faith in a God who seems distant and out of control of what's going on with us? You can kind of imagine Esau in our passage crying out to God, God, this isn't what I planned. I thought you'd have blessed me in a different way. I wonder if you've ever felt like that. Lord, I've been asking you to do this in my life, but instead you've done something that seems completely opposite. That's how Hannah and I felt for a lot of last year. We can feel disappointed, but maybe God can still use uh, these trials and these hard times in our lives for good. In a couple of weeks, we're going to come to the character of Joseph in, um, in our sermon series. And Joseph, he was sold into slavery by his brothers kind of the worst of the worst situations for him. But God used it incredibly powerfully um, for many, many people. And at the end of his life, Joseph comes to his brothers and he says this. He says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good, to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. God uses a horrible situation for Joseph, ultimately for good, a situation where God seemed distant and out of control. So could he do that for us too? Think about how messy the situation is for Isaac and his family. It's really messy. It's a family tricking each other, deceiving each other. It's so dysfunctional. How on earth could God be in control of that situation? But we know God uses this mess for good. That's part of what's so beautiful about God's kingdom. He uses messy, he uses imperfect people Think about everyone named in the Bible. Not, not a single person apart from Jesus Christ was, uh, had it all together, was perfect. Everyone is imperfect. You're imperfect. I'm imperfect. But God uses each one of us to show how good and kind and faithful he is. Yes, Isaac's situation was really messy, but God still showed his faithfulness. And there are three ways that God shows his faithfulness to Isaac Um, that I think are really relevant for us as well here today. Things that we can hold on to in the storms of our life about God's faithfulness. And the first one is this, that God's mercy is greater than our mess. God is so merciful to this family in this messy situation. He's merciful to Isaac. He is true to his promise that he will bless his family, even if it's different to how Isaac had expected it. He's merciful to Jacob too, who undeservedly receives the blessing owed to Esau. He's, and he's merciful to Esau too. Esau, who the writer of Hebrews comes to say, it was a godless man, who had sold his birthright to his brother for food, who had ignored his father's instruction not to marry a Canaanite woman, who was convinced that his good works had earned him the blessing from his father. Even he still receives a merciful blessing of grace. And it's amazing to see God's mercy uh, to Jacob and Esau. is so, there's so many parallels to the mercy of the father in the story of the prodigal son. That God the father, in all his great love for us, in all of our mess, whatever it looks like, has still shown us mercy in the person of Jesus Christ. He still comes running out to us with open arms. Nothing we have done is too messy for him to deal with. And there's nothing more we need to do than to come to him in order to receive it. So that's the first thing, that God's mercy is greater than our mess. And the second thing, God's wisdom is greater than our understanding. I don't know if you ever used to do this, but um, back home we used to sing Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6 as a memory verse. 
Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Anyone else say that? Just me? Great, wonderful. (laughs) Um, God in all his infinite wisdom, he knows best. We need to trust him and not our perception of what is going on, not our understanding of what is going on. It must have been so hard for Isaac to trust in God's wisdom when he realized that he had been deceived. We know how hard it is to trust people when we are deceived. Hasn't that been the fury with all our politicians over the past few months? And the sadness as we watch many global church leaders fall as well. But Isaac did trust in God's wisdom in this situation. He knew that God was wiser than his own understanding. Let that build your faith today, that God's wisdom is greater than what we could possibly understand. And then the third thing that we see today is that God's sovereignty is greater than our control. We love control, don't we? We love to to control our now. We love to try and control our future. One thing that I really love to control in my life is being on time for things. Um, I get really agitated if I'm late for something. You can ask Hannah the number of times that she's called me out for it. Um, It's unreal. But unfortunately for me, in these last few months, um, it turns out that little babies have no concept whatsoever of timing or um, of being late for things. So um, when Simi was just eight days old, we, we tried to come to church for the first time. It was going to be our first big outing as a family of three. And we were trying to come here to this 10.30 service, and the morning was going really well. We managed to get up on time. We were almost at the door. And then suddenly, Simi needed changing. And then he needed feeding. And then he needed changing again, and so on. And it was 12 o'clock by the time we finally made it here to church, possibly the latest that anyone's ever arrived to a service here. But God, in all his sovereignty, he has perfect timing. And as we look at Jacob in this story, it is clear that God allows him to receive the blessing. Jacob's name literally means the deceiver, as if even at birth, God ordained this moment for him. And God will continue to use Jacob in all his messiness. We're going to see that next week. That God will continue to use Jacob in all his messiness and all his problems to continue his promise to his people. If Isaac's plan had succeeded, if Isaac had been in control of that situation, Esau would have been blessed, not Jacob. And then the story would have been very different following on. But God knows best. He is sovereign. He is in control. He is Lord even in the mess. And the place that we see that most clearly is in the messiest situation of all time, where God, in all his sovereignty, he sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ, into this messy world, where Jesus uh, came and he, he bore the punishment that we owed for all our mess, all our sin, on the cross, in a situation that seemed like God was totally out of control, where God Almighty, where he couldn't do anything about his son being accused and beaten and mocked and scorned and hung on the cross. God used that for his ultimate victory over sin and death. God used the darkest day in history to bless each one of us today with forgiveness for our sins, with salvation for our souls, and the hope of eternal life with him. But it's interesting to think that on that day, No one knew that. For Jesus' followers, that truly was the darkest day in history. On on that day, everyone thought that it was over, that God was gone. But what a difference a little bit of time makes. Three days, in fact, it took for Jesus to to be risen from the grave. Three days later, we can look back and we can see God's great mercy. We can see God's great wisdom, God's great sovereignty in that messy situation. So for us today, sometimes we can't see how God is using a bad situation in our lives until later. But when we find ourselves in these situations, let us remember God's great faithfulness to us, that his mercy is greater than our mess, that his wisdom is greater than our understanding, that his sovereignty is greater than our control. Isaac, he was commended for his faith in hard times, in times that were out of his control. 
And my prayer for us today is that we, HTC, that we would be a church commended for our faith, not just in hard times, but in all circumstances. Let's be a family that can stand here together and we can stand here celebrating, remembering our experiences of God's faithfulness to us. Let that be our foundation. And let us be a church, let us be a family that encourages one another to stand firm in our faith, just like Isaac did, just like the rest of Faith's National Portrait Gallery did. Amen.